So the reason we do the meeting the way we do the meeting, if you'll go to your book and go to the forward to the first edition, I'll show you a couple things that maybe you hadn't had pointed out to you before that will help you understand why we speak in our own language around these rooms and people do not understand us. The first forward to the, the first edition tells us who the we is up there. And it's important to know who the we is because if my experience isn't aligning with their experience, then I'm going to have at least have some direction. Does that make sense? Because yep. they tell us later in another chapter, rarely we've seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. So if I'm not getting the experiences they describe, then I can look inward instead of outward and see what's up. Fair enough? Okay, so it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of the book. So notice how they didn't say to tell others. Right. Yep. A recovered person from addiction is better discovered by another than declared. Have you ever noticed that? Yep. So apparently someone had to show me how to find my experience in the book. They sat down with me and they showed me. And I'm attempting to show you how I find it, not tell you what your experience is, show you how I find it. Right? Because it won't work for you unless it's your experience. Does that make sense? It's yeah. a book of experience. How many of you have had people come up to you after you've been at this a while, probably not even a long while, and said, man, I don't know what you're doing, but keep it up, you're doing good. Yeah. Did you not show them precisely how you've recovered? And you didn't even know that's what you were showing, did you? That's when you have an opportunity to bear witness to your third step commitment. Yeah, I got God. He sees to it. I do a little better. Right? Okay. All right. So it says, for, for them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And besides, we're sure that our way of living has its advantages for all. So you're going to find out they're going to tell you of an unfolding manner of living they suggest. Okay, so I'm going to jump from that point over to the doctor's, uh, the doctor's opinion, XXVI. But I want to look at the writing of the authors about the doctor's opinion. Because I, how, do I have any physicians in the room? Every once in a while we do have some. Not just practicing medicine, actually licensed. Oh. But I got you, man, I know that. Yeah. Okay, so for most of us, the layman's discussion is easier to understand than the doctor's opinion. We'll try and break it down. So it says the physician who at our request gave us this letter, has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. So he had a little letter that was in the book and then he's got an expanded statement that is the doctor's opinion that most of us read, right? And then it says, in this statement he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe. Now they're telling us as people who have recovered that this is an important belief. Would it make sense to see what they think is so important? Okay, they said that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. Did you guys know that? We don't focus on that, the bodily condition of addiction as much as we do the mental, do we, in our rooms. But they say, if I don't believe that I'm bodily different, I'm going to have problems. Yeah. Okay, so it says it did not satisfy us to be told we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to lie. Did any of you get told you were maladjusted to lie? <laughs> not exactly that way. <laughs> That we're in full flight from reality or we're outright mental defectives. Did any of you get told anything like that? Yes. Yeah. Did you agree some percentage of the time? No. Sometimes we do. Some, right? Okay. It says that these things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us, but we're sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. So how many of you have heard the jokes about I got an allergy. I break out in handcuffs. <laughs> you ever heard that? Yeah. Did it ever not make sense to you like it doesn't make sense to anyone if it's not explained? How many of you are drinkers? When you drink, do you find that alcohol energizes you? Yes! It is a sedative. That's, that's an abnormal reaction to a sedative. So a doctor looking at that who is not alcoholic would say, my, that's curious. That may be the manifestation of an allergy. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion to its soundness may, of course, mean little, but as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that this explanation makes good sense. Do you understand now why when if it's supposed to sedate me and instead it energizes me, I might overshoot the mark from time to time? <laughs> Anybody here ever overshoot the mark? <laughs> So for as alcoholics, that makes good sense. It at least explains this weird reaction because my intent was not to overshoot the mark. Any of you ever have an intent to keep it on the... <laughs> it explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. And then it goes on to tell us what they do from there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump from there over to page 24. We've talked about the physical manifestation. When I put alcohol in my body, I have an abnormal reaction to that chemical. What if, if, if you're here as an opiate addict, you have the same abnormal reaction. How many of you went and got some kind of, I don't know whether you were doing pharmaceuticals or what you were doing, you are probably doing whatever you could get, but the minute you did that, all of a sudden you had energy again, new life. That's abnormal. Yeah. That's supposed to sedate us. And to us, if we'd slam it and then not out, we'd just wreck the whole fucking deal, huh? Bummer. Okay. That might be considered abnormal by, you know, the average gentleman heroin chooser. Ah! You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so go to page 24. We've talked about the physical thing. There's a mental thing, a mental component. It says, at a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. So regardless of what chased you into these rooms, do you remember the time that you really did not want to do this anymore and knew you were absolutely going to do it some more? Yes. Yes. Did you get to the point where you had no expectation of it turning out well, you simply were doing it anyway? Yes. Did you hear people in the room saying, I do the same thing expecting different results? Yes. Did you feel like you didn't fit here? No. Because that's not what these guys say. They don't ever tell us we do the same thing expecting a different result. They tell us we have an appalling lack of perspective. In light of my past experience, the idea that I can take a drink even one is completely ridiculous. Because I burn the fucking house down. <laughs> Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay. All right. So we've got to get honest about that I have had the experience of powerlessness. Not, and you know, I don't know what it looks like to you. It may be, you know, I'm not picking up even one, and then, ah, oh, perhaps I overreacted. You ever had that happen? Okay, something like that. All right, so the tragic situation has already arrived in practically every case long before it's suspected. So how many of you would feel like hell, go out and medicate yourself, and then convince yourself you meant to do it? <laughs> After the train was already out of the station. <laughs> You ever had that happen? Oh, yeah. So it happens long before it's suspected, yeah. that loss of power and choice. Right. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. So now they've got it in italics. We want to pay attention when they put it in italics. They want us to look inward when they do that. G guys, get this and if you don't get anything else tonight. Eyesight without insight is spiritual blindness. We've been walking around spiritually blind. Yep. So what we want to do is get ownership of this. Does it make sense? Some of you are feeling Who's feeling that? That's the power we call God around here. That's not coming from the speaker. Eyesight without insight is spiritual blindness. Because I only see my thoughts. I don't really see what's going on. And then I'm always under attack. Does it make sense? Okay. All right. So the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. What does it mean to have lost the power of choice? Got to have it. I can't stop once I start, and I can't stay away from it. That, in simple terms, have you had that experience? Yes. Yes. Have you ever lost anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mean had something that you replaced, but I mean like dropped your cell phone in the ocean. <laughs> now you have lost that cell phone. You may get another cell phone. <laughs> Does that make sense? So they're, they're telling me that if I'm this guy, this idea that I can choose whether to use or not is gone. Yes. Right. Now I'm the only one who knows, 
but that's their experience. And if a lot of the shit they're telling me makes sense for me, I might want to pay attention. Because we don't generally get here on a winning streak. Okay. Okay, so our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. Guys, if you're beating yourself up for years of abuse of drugs and alcohol, this is the there's an explanation for my illness. I've been selfish and inconsiderate, and I'm going to have an opportunity to make that right. But I've been sick, not bad. Right. Right. And if you don't know that, you may not give yourself permission to move into the recovered state. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You didn't start out drinking or using any different than your body allowed you because of this abnormal reaction, maybe the manifestation of an allergy. You used the only way you could use because that's the way you're wired. How many of you found there were other people in your family wired similarly? <laughs> Wonder how that should happen, huh? <laughs> okay. So our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago were without defense against the first drink. So they separated the idea of memory from consciousness. Mm -hmm. So clearly they're not talking about the same. When I get into a manner of living that's going to raise my consciousness, it has nothing to do with memory. Right. Because consciousness is more powerful than memory. Yep. How many of you have felt some of the spirit movement through here tonight? Yeah. That's what we're going to improve consciousness of, not suffering power, peace, happiness, and a sense of direction. Start to make sense? Yeah. Bill Wilson was a famous agnostic. He said it's more logical to believe than not to believe based on our experience. See if your experience aligns with ours. Yeah. Screw that religion. Get into relationship. That's what Bill said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go from there to, let's go through Bill's story. I like, because I like drunks telling drunk stories. <laughs> Because we really, rather than get into a lot of medical stuff, I just want to take the mystery out of both the bodily and mental thing and then just look at Bill's experience describing it. Fair enough? Yeah, okay. sure. So Bill Wilson, uh, Bill's story, page five, and he starts talking about his pro progressive loss of control. He says, liquor ceased to be a luxury, it became a necessity. How many of you can remember that crossing over? I'm not doing this because I want to, I'm doing this because I have to. Bathtub gin, two bottles a day, often three got to be routine. So he's telling you what it looked like for him. You'll have to substitute whatever yours looked like to align with him. Not everyone drank bathtub gin. Most of us wouldn't know where to get bathtub gin. <laughs> Most of us. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars, and I'd pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. This went on endlessly, and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. So how many of you had those gradual awakenings to your loss of control, and you were sick to death in the morning, but you knew if you could get some down, you could get less sick, yep. and then you could go hustle so you could pay off your bills so you could get on the hook again? Yep. Fucking what a plan, hey? <laughs> Anyone relate to that kind of victory? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So a tumbler full of gin followed by a half dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation. So he's telling you about his state of mind. Even though he's running around borrowing money so he can get back on the hook for more, he's shaking and sick and has to pour it down and throw it up and pour it down so he can hustle, going through all the crap we go through, I got this shit. <laughs> you relate to him? Yeah. Any of you ever thought you had it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got it. <laughs> Where's my drinkers? We're pukers, man, right? Good morning, pukers. Anytime. Anytime. I called it a capacity increase, you know what I mean? Yeah. All right. So, and there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Gradually, things got worse. So he's still in the delusion that he's the only one who knows. How many of you have noticed that what you thought was gradual, other people thought was a complete train wreck? Because <laughs> he's going to describe what gradually is to him, and then you've got to put yourself in the place of these family members that are watching it. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died, and my, my wife and father-in-law became ill. So everybody who's taking care of him is getting sick or dying, and the house is getting taken over. But gradually, things got worse. I can't imagine. A series of un unfortunate circumstances. 
Anyone relate to that? Okay. All right, so then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks are at the low point of 1932, and I had somehow formed a group to buy. I was to share generously in the profits. Did you guys ever get an opportunity thrown at you in active addiction? Yeah. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> what Bill says is, then I went on a prodigious bender, and that chance vanished. Now, we don't usually talk about prodigious benders, but most of us can relate to going out to celebrate the new opportunity. <laughs> and then completely missing the opportunity. Okay. I woke up, this had to be stopped. How many of you have had such an awakening? I saw that I could not take so much as one drink. I was through forever. Have you had that conclusion? Anybody? I'm not telling anybody that has it, but have you ever got to the point where you're like, oh yeah, this is not gonna go well. Okay. Before then, I had written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. Did you finally share with somebody else your doubts about your own ability to stop? Yes. yes. And did they get on board and go, oh, you're doing so good? Yes. Did they encourage you? Yes. Did you really feel bad when you knew you were going to fuck them over and let them down? <laughs> you're really not fucking them over, but that's how it feels, right? Yeah. Powerless is not a theory, guys. You gotta get powerless is not a theory, it's an experience. And we gotta own that that's what's happened to us. Even though we giggle about it, it ain't funny when it's happening. Okay, shortly afterward I came home drunk. So now he's starting to talk about his thoughts again. There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? Inward, insight. He meant it. It's not safe to even have one. And now he's home drunk. Can any of you relate to that? Yes. yes. I simply didn't know, it hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way and I had taken it. Was I crazy? Inward again. How many of you had those thoughts? Wondering if you were sane. How many of you had other people wondering if you were sane? I began to wonder for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. So he's telling us about the insanity we experience as an appalling lack of perspective, right? All right, so renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed and confidence began to be replaced by cocksureness. You guys ever had the experience of confidence getting replaced by a cockiness? Yeah. Yes. I went for I hope this works to I got this shit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the reason we suggest the program and the fellowship and steps is that at some point I'm going to have to have access to power. And I'll get some grace in the beginning. What happens here when confidence gets replaced by cocksureness is I confuse the experience of grace with the delusion of control. And pretty soon, I'm in trouble. Have any of you been the, one of those 30-day people? Couldn't quite get the... I was, man. I had a sack full. Okay, all right. So um, now I, had, I could laugh at the gin in the mills. I had, now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone and... No time, I was beating on the bar asking myself as, it, as how it happened. So have you ever found yourself drinking when you knew it wasn't safe to have even one? After you took the first drink, what happened? Another, another, and another, and another, please. <laughs> he says, as the whiskey rose to my, set, my head, I told myself I'd manage better next time, but I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did. <laughs> now pay attention to his delusion. He doesn't know he's lost the power of choice. Right. He's now convincing himself he chose to take that drink, even though it was in completely insane to take that first drink. Yes. You cannot make a choice with an unsound mind. Right. If you don't believe your alcoholism or addiction and illness, you may never get this. You may never seek the healing you need because you don't. You just think you're weak. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's important that we get that. Okay, the remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. So it says they're unforgettable. How many of you can remember the remorse, horror, and hopelessness after you knew it wasn't yeah. safe and you did it again? Yeah. How many of you people that never did it again can remember having those drunk dreams and waking up and you're like, who do I tell? How do I tell them? How do I tell them? <laughs> remorse, horror. Anyway, who's feeling that? Oh, yeah. So it is remorse, and it is unforgettable, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So my brace raced uncontrollably and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. So he's talking about the sensory experience of I am really in trouble. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Not when you're saying it outward, 
where I know in my innermost self that I am in trouble. This is not going to turn out well, and I don't seem to be in control of what happens next. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right, so I hardly dare cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me that the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. Yeah. Then he says, that was a hard thought. Yeah. Did you get to a place, crossover in your mind, where you knew that if I never try again, I can't fail again. Therefore, I'm riding this train out. Because that's what he's talking about. He said, I'm going to die of this, and there's nothing I seem to be able to do about it. It is a hard thought, isn't it? Okay. Should I kill myself? So he knows he's killing himself with alcohol. That's not a theory. But now he's saying, should I take it into my own hands? You ever had those thoughts? Yes. No, not now. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> then a middle fog settled down. Okay, so now he's describing, I can always quiet that storm with a little spirit. Yep. Anyone relate to what he's talking about? Yeah. A middle fog settled down, gin would fix that. <laughs> and so two bottles and oblivion. Yeah. The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms for mine endured this agony two more years. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weekly. So any of you do any of that? Yeah. Go take money from someone in the house when there was no earthly explanation for where else the money went. Yeah. <laughs> and then thought, well, they're going to find out, but I'm going to lie. I'm going to help them look for it. We're gonna, it's going to be a whole day thing. <laughs> There were flights from the city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. And then came the, the night when the physical and mental torture was so hellish I feared I would burst through my windows, sash and all. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to a lower floor lest I suddenly leap. And a doctor came with a heavy sedative. How many of you started showing up at ERs? Doctors don't come to our houses much anymore. But started showing up at, at ERs with some kind of pain condition that would require some kind of heavy sedative, either an opiate or, or benzo or some combination. Did you find that a cocktail of opiates and benzos and alcohol was kind of a nice way to cruise through the rest of the week? <laughs> Think I'm kidding, he's about to tell us about that shit. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. <laughs> We think we invented this shit. They wrote this book in 35, man. They, the guy knew how to make a cocktail with a little benzo and whatever, right? How many of you got treated, treated for your alcoholism as, a, as an Ativan deficiency? <laughs> Some of Valium, whatever, whatever you're dealing with. Okay, this combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feel, feared for my sanity. So did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking. I was 40 pounds underweight. My brother-in-law is a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. Now, it was interesting at that time, if you go to Sean's study, you'll learn more about it, but at that time, they really didn't have a diagnosis of alcoholism, so it really was odd to be a hospital that treated alcoholics. Because they didn't, they didn't acknowledge it, right? Um, under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much. Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though, though certainly selfish and foolish, I'd been seriously ill bodily and mentally. So again, it's a, I gotta be accountable for how foolish and, and selfish I have been, but there's an explanation for it. It's not an excuse, it's an explanation. So I can live with me, so that now I can have a desire to live and help others. Does that make sense? Okay. So it relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor. So why would my will be ama amazingly weakened? I drink to fulfill a craving beyond So once I drink, the drink takes the drink. Yeah. Any of you ever had that experience? Yeah. yeah. And, and the problem with that is even when I know that, I can't stop myself from taking a drink because I get so miserable that I, 
I've just got to get a spiritual release, and I know where to get it. I pour spirits down my neck. Okay. All right, so, though it often remains strong in other respects, my incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Does that help anybody? Oh, yeah. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. He uses a lot of flowery language we don't use today. What's it mean that the goose hung high? He's got the champion. <laughs> I'm so ready, great to be sober, I got this shit. Yeah. Any of you have done that? I went to town regularly, even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. So how many of you got a good dose of self-knowledge? And felt pretty good about that self-knowledge. I meet a lot of people that have been in the fellowship for a lot of years, haven't really got into the program, and they're running around on self-knowledge, and then they get miserable multiple years in, and they got to dig back in. I, I don't know how many people I've met 10, 20, 30 years sober that needed to have a second step of truth. Don't wait that long. If you're here sooner than that. Okay. All right. So, but it was not, for the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. So he's painting a picture for you. How many of you used again or drank again after you've been clean a while? And things didn't just get bad, they got bad quick. Because when it falls off like a ski jump, you ever watch those guys go up a ski jump? Yeah, it, the bottom falls out. Okay. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was the finish, the curtain it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens or I would develop a wet brain perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. They did not need to tell me, I knew and almost welcomed the idea. So listen to what he's talking to you about. Mental and emotional. I'm dying, of course I'm dying, tell me when. Tell me something, I'm not being glib, you know what I'm talking about? Hell yes, I'm dying, but not quick enough. You ever get a doctor to tell you that, and you're like, you got a medical degree to tell you that shit? Okay. okay. So I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. Did any of you get to that point? See, because my pride's going to keep me trying what I know in my heart I cannot accomplish. You know why I cannot accomplish it? Because it takes no power to not do. That's right. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I who had thought so well of myself and my abilities and my capacity to surmount obstacles was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark joining that endless procession of sots who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife, there had been much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends, but that was over now. Now listen to his experience, see if you can relate to him. No words can tell the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Yep. Can you take yourself to the time when you knew it wasn't going to work, you didn't think anything else was going to work, there's no way to make my life right. And then, come on, I'm not feeling you. Oh, yeah. Feel yeah. Take, a, take a ride into that powerlessness and unmanageable state. And then you, then you know what they're talking about. Because no words can define it, can they? No. That's why we feel alone, because we have been alone in a crowded room. Yeah. Okay. So, I found, oh, wait a minute, quicksand stretched around me in all direction. I had met my match. I'd been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Fierce over me for a bit. So how many of you have had fierce over yet for a minute? Then came the insidious insanity of that first streak, and on Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. So always understand the insanity we talk about initially is the insanity of the first streak. Knowing all that I know about me and what's going to happen, I take the first streak. I'm certifiably insane when I take the first drink. So this yep. beating people up. After, after the first drink, it's... The drink takes the drink, and before that, I'm certifiably insane, right. which is why finding ease and comfort in the world without going out in the world to get it is essential for the alcoholic. Right. Okay, so everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. 
how dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was to be the beginning of my last about. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. So a lot of people have speculated, I've even speculated over the years what that is, but he tells you what it is to yeah. him. So let's, rather than speculate, let's see what Bill says it is. How's that? Yeah. He said, I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. So to be rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence to Bill is to know happiness, peace, and usefulness. How many of you have had an experience of knowing usefulness? The difference between thinking you're being useful and feeling that you're being useful. Yes. Yes. How many of you have had the experience of knowing peace? An absence of conflict in your thought life. Yeah. It's fleeting, but we know it, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you got to discipline the thought life all the time. Why a manner of living? Because I get attacked all the time. Yeah. Any of you had, ever had an attack in your thought life? Yes. How many times tonight? Yeah. We just walk in and see somebody in the room and it attacks, right? <laughs> okay, so near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen. With a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. Any of you drinkers? For those of you who don't know us drinkers, drinkers are hiders. How many, how many of you hid your stuff? Where's my meth addicts? You people are, you guys are hiders too. I won't even speculate on the hair. I never had enough left over when I was doing opiates. There wasn't nothing to hide. I was hiding them from everybody else, maybe. Uh, anyway. All right. So, with a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. My wife was at work, and I wondered whether I dared hide a bottle, full bottle near, of gin near the head of our bed. I'd need it before daylight. So how many of you got to the point where you had to medicate before you got up? Because you had the attack of the DTs, not just the shakes, the delusions. Okay, so you, you got where he's at. Okay. My musing was interrupted by the telephone. A cheery voice from an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. Now, Bill, that's in italics. So, you know, somebody coming over is interesting. But somebody coming over sober is a freaking event. <laughs> When I'm in, you know what I mean? Yeah. How many of you, no matter how bad it got for you, you maintained somebody that was just a little worse than you? So that's who this cat is for Bill. So no matter how bad it got for Bill, he said, at least I'm not that bad yet. And now this cat calls, and he's in town, and he's sober, and Bill's like, holy shit. Okay, so, so he would set the stage. It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. So you got to get how amazed that Ebby would call and Ebby would be sober. Yeah. That cannot happen. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Rumor had it that he'd been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wondered how he had escaped. Yeah. So this guy had busted out of prison to come yeah. see me. Okay. Of course he'd have dinner and I could drink openly with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. So how many of you got to where you couldn't use or drink around anyone else hardly at all? For a lot of reasons. But then somebody came that was at least as bad, if not worse than you. And you're like, and I got enough. So you can see why he would describe that as an oasis, right? Unfortunately, you just caught alcoholism because drinkers are like that. Okay. All right. Okay. The door opened and he stood there, fresh skinned and glowing. Guys, just just to the men, is that a weird way to describe your drinking, buddy? Yes. 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 Women, yes. would that be a weird way to describe your drinking, buddy? Really strange for men, but probably strange for anyone, right? To describe them as fresh-skinned and glowing. Obviously, this guy had something new about him. Yes? Yeah. Yes. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different what had happened. So instantly, he's having the experience, and he's going inward going, what is up with this cat? I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed, but curious, I wondered what had got into the fellow. He wasn't himself. 
So you ever had the experience of being disappointed, but curious? Yes. Yes. It's like, man, I was hoping to just twist it off with you. <laughs> oh, well, more for me. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Got it? <laughs> just because you're sober doesn't mean I'm not drinking, but go, come now. Tell me, right? Okay. All right, so come. What's all this about, I queried. He looked straight at me, simply but smilingly. smilingly he said, I've got religion. <laughs> now get honest with yourself. I don't care what your religious beliefs are. You're sitting there drinking. You got more. You're planning on a party. And you ask somebody who shows up what's into them. They say, I got religion. Does the fun meter not go? Because <laughs> <laughs> regardless of my religious beliefs, I'm about to get a fucking lecture. And I... <laughs> Right? Because that's the way we think. There's an expectation, right? Okay, I was aghast, so that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic cracked, but now I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart, let him rant. Where's my southerners? What's she saying? What's... Bless his heart, what we say? Yeah, or something like that. Oh. That was a nice word. <laughs> I like idiot. Yeah. Okay. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. So he's got an expectation. There's going to be a, a sermon. But I'm going to just drink my way on through it, and it's going to be okay. Okay? Yeah. But he did no ranting. Now that's disturbing. Even more. In a matter-of-fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. Guys, don't lie to our new people when we meet them. We have a simple religious idea. God dwells in you. Yeah. And a yeah. practical program of action, a manner of living which will prove that fact to you, through you, the absolute certainty yeah. that the Creator has entered my heart and lives. Yeah. And if we don't tell people that and we say things like, well, we're, we're spiritual, we're not really, I don't even know what the fuck that means. <laughs> I've had people go to church with me and say, thank you for showing me your spiritual side. I say, I have a spiritual entirety. I showed you my religious side. Do you understand? Yeah. There, this I do because I'm an alcoholic. If I don't have spiritual release, ease and comfort in the world without going out in the world to get it, I will burn the place down. Yep. Just a matter of time. Yep. Okay. So that was two months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. He had come to pass his experience along to me if I cared to have it. I was shocked but interested. Notice how they worded that. What did he come to pass on to Bill? Experience. experience. His experience. I don't pass you this experience, this encounter with this power that we improve consciousness of, then I've given you nothing if you're an alcoholic or a hopeless riot. He didn't come to pass his fellowship list on to him. When he walked in and he saw him standing there, fresh-skinned and glowing, Bill encountered the presence of the power we call God. Right. He didn't know it at the time, but he knew the guy was inexplicably different. And he could feel it, and it was causing him, even in his drunken state, to reflect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. He talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church folk and their doings, his insistence that the spears really had their music, but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen. His fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. So he's talking about his memory of his grandfather that was close to him, and his grandfather said, I'm not going to let the preacher tell me how to worship my God. Even up to his death, he declared that. So he knew that, if nothing else, his father had a relationship with this power. He wasn't going to be told how to think. And it, it welled up on him, that memory of his ideas about the church and the certainty that his grandfather walked in, said it, made him swallow hard. Have you ever had a revelation within you and it pushed an emotional experience out of you? Yeah. Would you consider that making you swallow hard? Yes. See how he's talking about the sensory nature of the power. So that power expressed itself as a revelation and then it caused him to be aware, conscious, aware that he was aware of a power moving in and through it, showing him his life. Any of you ever had a similar experience? Yes. That's the power we call God. He's trying to describe that experience to us. 
Okay. So that wartime day in the old Winchester Cathedral came back again. So you remember that story? The guy had drank himself to death after having survived war. Okay. I had always believed in a power greater than myself. I would often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means the blind faith in a strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces at work. Despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be such, so much precise and immutable law and no intelligence? So all, Bill is rationalizing the power and he's experiencing the power. So he's saying, okay, there must be more to this life than I think there is to it. There's something underlying it. There has to be some intelligent design. That's enough for him to get started. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay, I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe who knew, knew neither time nor limitation, but that was as far as I had gone. With ministers and the world's religions, I parted right there. When they talked of a God personal to me, I was, who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, I became irritated, and my mind sh snapped shut against such a theory. So did you guys get where he's going? He had a lot of religious prejudice. Are you with me? So if you guys are more religious, don't get your knickers in a knot. Bill's just telling you what happened to him. And it, look, we, we gotta, you got to understand, if spirit talks to spirit, you're going to get some disturbances in here. When you do, it's not me. It's happening within you. Go inward and find out why. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay.